These opening actions have attracted much attention and at the time provoked various claims that the tank was finished as a weapon. No, this is not a statement about the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022. This is about the Yom Kippur War from 1973. Additionally, these tank losses were mostly suffered by the Israeli forces, which had a very good track record in armored warfare. As such, those claims back then had probably far more merit than those claims that come up nowadays. I am Bernard Kast and today we look at the many deaths of the tank. Technically the tank must be a zombie since he died so many times that he still seems to roam the battlefield. In this video I will address various statements that were made that the tank is dead and then also cover why I don't think it is the case this time. I am aware of the video by Ralf Ratz from the Panzer Museum, as such I added some new points, particularly in the historical section with some very nice quotes. Let's at first address the situation at hand. The current war in Ukraine produced a lot of videos and photos of destroyed Russian tanks in western and social media. It also made a lot of people overnight experts in military matters, tactics, foreign policy and many other things. In Germany, particularly quite many people that even had a problem with military history got a bit hawkish. This kind of reminds me of an interesting definition of populism, namely that populism is using an oversimplified answer to a complex problem. Or in our case, people talking about the end of the tank that probably could not tell the difference between a badly drawn rock and a Panzerkampfwagen 3 Ausführung L. So let us look at some of the various factors at play in Ukraine in the last few weeks. First off, for various reasons like weather, knowledge of terrain, maintenance and capabilities of vehicles and likely other factors, Russian tanks stuck quite a lot to the roads, at least in the northern parts of Ukraine. This of course leads to higher losses, particularly if your enemy knows the terrain rather well. This is particularly important for artillery fire, to quote a US regulation from 1991 intended for field artillery support teams. One of the key requirements for the deliberate of accurate predicted fire on a target is accurate target location. To successfully perform his duties, the observer must be able to determine an accurate position of a target on the ground. We can assume the Ukrainian military did this, particularly for all important choke points and likely many other locations as well. Thank you to Andrew for pointing this out. This by the way is nothing new. The Finns prior to the Winter War mapped out large portions of their country for artillery, something I covered in this video. Second, generally in war it is better to make sure an enemy vehicle, particularly one that is as dangerous as a tank, is destroyed. As such the question must be asked how many of these tanks were actually abandoned beforehand and or hit again after they were already out of action. Third, abandoned tanks that are captured outside of combat by tractors or otherwise are not really combat losses. Those are abandoned vehicles and this has a lot to do with maintenance, logistics and morale. But very little with tanks itself. If you have bad maintenance, logistics and morale, basically every weapon system will perform badly in and outside of combat. Of course, complex vehicles like tanks require more and more sophisticated maintenance and logistics. And if what is outlined by Trent and Elko is correct, then the Russian army is not really capable of maintaining its trucks or better their wheels very well. Yet nobody is arguing that this is the end of the truck in military service or rubber wheels on vehicles. Fourth, according to an analysis by Colin Reisner from the Austrian Armed Forces, the Ukrainians are provided with vital intelligence by NATO. This combined with their knowledge of terrain, special tactics and likely trained troops for such tasks allow them to strike behind enemy lines and conduct ambushes that either directly kill tanks in vulnerable moments and or wreak havoc on the supply lines, the later increasing the chances of abandonment due to breakdowns and or lack of petrol, oil and lubricants. Fifth, a tank alone or even a tank platoon alone is generally not a good idea. Or in other words, if you fail at combined arms warfare and you face a determined and capable enemy you will suffer under regular circumstances disproportionately high losses. To quote East German regulation from 1976. Interaction of mechanized infantry with tanks is prerequisite for success in the attack. Interaction means coordinating the combat actions of mechanized infantry and tanks to accomplish the task. Be aware I am rather sure that any other regulation about mechanized warfare after World War II and in some cases even before would contain something similar. Additionally, it seems that quite a lot of losses come down to ambushes. 
which are generally the result of underestimation of the enemy, lack of reconnaissance, insurgencies, overestimation of one's own forces, bad leadership, and many other points. Tanks are vulnerable in ambushes, that was always the case. But what or who isn't vulnerable in an ambush? Particularly by highly motivated troops that fight on their own terrain. So let us talk about the general points. The Russians lost quite many tanks and other armored fighting vehicles. Their reaction to this is quite interesting, because it seems that some people either don't know what war is, or that vehicle losses, particularly tank losses, are something ordinary in war. Let us look a bit at the Second World War. In terms of Sherman losses, from June 1944 to April 1945, Saloga notes a total of 4,295 tanks. For the US forces in the European theater of operations. So this was for 11 months, so about 390 tanks per month. Now of course, as mentioned in the previous video, comparisons between the current war and world wars are a bit of a problem since the scales are vastly different, in particular nowadays far more equipment is mechanized. Yet this point is about the fact that tanks get lost in combat all the time. And we should add here that the US losses were likely on the lower end as well. To quote Alaric Searle about solid losses, if we consider the armor loss rates in the Great Patriotic War, Red Army tank and self-propelled gun losses have been given in an official Soviet report of 1988-89 as follows. For 1941, beginning of the 2nd June, 20,500. In 1942, 15,100. In 1943, 23,500. In 1944, 23,700. And up to May 1945, 13,700. There are some discrepancies in the figures, so that overall losses have been estimated between 87,300 and 95,924. One Russian authority, Krivoshev, gives the total number of irreplaceable tank losses at 63,229, whereas Stephen Zalowa gives the figure of 83,500 as the total number. But it has never been clear whether the figures for irreplaceable losses include the number of land lease tanks. Of course, someone might blame this on German tanks and anti-tank weapons, but I got you covered here. So let us look shortly at German tank losses during the invasion of Poland. Germany deployed about 2,859 tanks, of which 674 were knocked out, which means 23.6% losses. 217 or 236 of these were irrecoverable losses depending on the source. So 7.6% or 8.3% lost. And keep in mind that the Polish armor had a limited number of tanks and anti-tank weapons. Tanks were concentrated in specific divisions. Germans had air superiority and various other advantages as well. In short, in war tanks get destroyed. Lots of them. And far more people get killed. This might sound like Captain Obvious, but it seems a lot of people seem to have forgotten the first and even the second part. Needless to say, tanks were and likely never will be invulnerable. This is probably not news to you, but there seems to be quite many people that probably should do a bit more reading and less talking. But I already hear some typing in the far background that there's something completely new in this conflict, namely that the Ukrainians were able to capture so many tanks. Well, actually no, this is not something particularly new. The Germans in World War I had more captured tanks in their service than they produced themselves. And then there was also the Winter War. For its part, the Finnish army captured a total of 600 armored vehicles and the recovered T-26 became its principal tank. Since we got that flank covered, let us move on to the more chronological part of this video. Let us look at the various end of tank arguments and assessments about tanks in terms of combined arms warfare. This should provide a better understanding of the weapon system tank as part of armed forces compared to seemingly simple weapon that is looked at without any context nor understanding of military doctrine. So let us start in the First World War. Since some people state that the tank is obsolete finish too expensive, this basically implies that the tank was effective and or cost effective at other times. About the First World War, the German military historian Markus Pöllmann notes, success with tanks, this had been the bitter lesson of the Allies in 1917, was not achieved by the mere massing of vehicles alone but by their careful integration into the principles of industrialized mass warfare, which in turn the weapon itself was beginning to change. 
In other words, without proper combined arms warfare doctrine, your tanks will not be particularly effective if you fight a proper enemy. Similarly, the American scholar Mary Habeck notes, Analysis of battles in which tanks had taken part showed that even in those clashes in which the tanks had been mostly successful, German troops had been able to blunt the assault, bring artillery to bear, and retake lost ground. Let us move to the interwar period. Here the first strong statements about the tank being obsolete shows up. One was by Major General Al Jackson, Master General of Ordnance, in December 1919 at the Royal United Service Institution. He noted that the tank proper was a freak. The circumstances which called it into existence were exceptional and are not likely to recur. To some evidently the usefulness of tanks was confined to trench warfare and the latter was not expected to occur again. Of course, the cost argument also comes up. For instance, the German memorandum from 1925 noted, recognized that the expensive weapons like tanks were something that only rich nations could afford, especially given the poor track record of armor during the last war. What definitely changed during the interwar period was that dedicated anti-tank weapons were built in larger numbers. During the first world war, there were dedicated anti-tank weapons like the anti-tank rifles, which had a limited effectiveness. In late war, the first dedicated anti-tank guns showed up, but they were not that common. For this and other reasons, there was a heated debate, as discussed in an article by Walter Nehring, about anti-tank defense from 1936. Nehring later became a Panzergeneral. The various thoughts about the armored branch are shown in the dispute of opinions of the military journals of all countries. They cause confusion so that the layman cannot distinguish whether the armored fighting vehicle is really a moving coffin, as someone wrote recently, or represents the weapon whose appearance on the battlefield guarantees decisive victory, as again others maintain. Unsurprisingly, Nehring also makes a point about not looking at aspects without considering the context. They overlook Scharnhorst's stern caution, one must not consider the individual objects without the whole. One of the most important German publications about the tanks in the interwar period was from the Austrian Fritz Heigl. His Taschenbuch der Tanks, basically a pocket book about tanks, was even republished by the German army. The book series was continued after his death. The volume about tank combat states about the tank warfare between 1918 to 1938 that improvised measures were successful against tanks and that, everywhere, successful tests of strength for the modern defensive weapons are also taking place and have again and again given rise to the dangerous exhalation of the world war. This is the end of tank attacks. The year of the world war, 1918, however, showed sufficiently how dangerous such belief in safety is. Even if temporarily a complete superiority of anti-tank defense had actually been achieved. I particularly really like the next line for several reasons, and if one removes, changes a few words, it is almost a universal statement. Post-war anti-tank results, however, are by no means compelling lessons for the future, for they all suffer from the particular circumstances of the battles in question and from journalistic exaggeration. Oh well, I thought it was war, war never changes. I guess it's not the only but terrible thing that does not change. Anyway, let's continue with the quote. Unless armored forces are used in accordance with the great lessons of the world war against the power equipped with modern defenses, any new experience assumed to be justified can be considered only in the context of the field of battle concerned. Not a single post-war tank engagement, however, has yet shown the trial of strength between modern anti-tank and large tank units except as an undecided maneuver picture. Both arms are mutually evolving and must constantly keep pace with each other. For simplicity and brevity, I will skip the second world war here and immediately look at the post-war assessments. Tanks emerged from the second world war as the preeminent component of the ground forces. However, their importance did not remain unchallenged, mainly because of the development during the latter part of the war of weapons firing projectiles or missiles with shaped charges. The very high velocity metallic jets formed by these charges could perforate the very thick armor, and this enables relatively light weapons and consequently infantrymen to knock out tanks and therefore reduce their effectiveness. And surprise, this of course led to statements about the end of the tank again. Such views were advanced among others by Dr. Vannevar Bush the head of the US Office of Scientific Research and Development during the war. 
In his influential book Modern Arms and Free Men, published in 1949, similar views were also held by the US Secretary of the Army, Pace, who shortly before the outbreak of the war in Korea in 1950, stated at the West Point Military Academy that tanks were obsolescent. That tanks did not become obsolete the next two years after that book is underlined by the fact that another major discussion about the end of the tank came in 1973 during the Yom Kippur War. This was due to the heavy losses suffered by the Israeli forces against anti-tank guided missiles. On the Sinai front, the successful assault crossing of the Suez Canal by Egyptian forces was followed immediately by counterattacks by the Israeli 252nd Division which ran into Egyptian infantry equipped with exceptionally large numbers of solid made Sega anti-tank guided missiles and failed, losing 165 of its 268 tanks. This immediately led to the worldwide rumors that tanks were no longer effective. It is very important here to point out that the Israelis had a very good track record in warfare and particularly armored warfare. As such, I think that that was probably the most legit time so far in history about the end of the tank statements although only briefly. Needless to say, the Israelis adapted their approach and effectiveness of Sega's as anti-tank weapons decreased. Sega teams were dealt with by concentrated small arms fire from mechanized infantry mounted in M113s, who simply aimed at the source of a Sega missile, thereby disrupting the control of the missile by the operators. Let us move on to the next aspect, drones. These specifically received a lot of attention during the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war between Azerbaijan, Armenia and Artsakh. Yet analysis shows that this was mostly the result of inadequate defenses and countermeasures since most weapon systems were outdated or simply not built to deal with such a threat. Yet while drones played a large role in this conflict, their capabilities are not to be exaggerated. These platforms are very vulnerable to air defenses that are designed to counter them. Defenses Armenia did not have in adequate numbers. The bulk of Armenia's air defenses consists of obsolete Soviet era systems like Krug, Orsa, Kup, and Strela 10. TB2s flew too high for these systems to intercept, even if they were able to detect these relatively small aircraft. Russian supplied Polar I 21 electronic warfare systems disrupted Azerbaijani drone operations, but only for four days. Armenia's book and Tor M2 KM air defenses likely downed a few drones, but they were deployed late in the conflict, limited in number, and vulnerable to attack themselves. Yet let's give the drone aspect also some general thought as well. For this I focus on reconnaissance drones. No matter what kind branch you are in, if the enemy sees you and you don't see him, you will have a very bad time. Particularly about tanks, this was always an issue. To quote the German regulation for the medium tank company from May 1941, a book Chris from Military Aviation History and I completely translated and published including the original text as well. The entry into the assembly area must be done silently, low engine speed. Camouflage against ground and air observation is particularly important. Track marks and skids caused by steering movements must be removed in order to conceal the presence of tanks from enemy aerial reconnaissance. So nothing new here and drone defense is important. The problem might be a bigger issue for tanks since they are preferred targets, but generally if the enemy has drone superiority, you will have a bad time. And I suspect once proper drone defenses are developed and deployed, the situation might be quite different. Now if you look at combined arms, as an example here, a simplified early German Panzer division, at one point drones likely will be fully integrated into the combined arms formations and to a certain degree this has already happened. I mean recon units were part of it already anyway. And at that point tanks then will also get the benefit from drones as well. And here again a statement from Nehring made in 1936 seems to be rather fitting. And at last the tanks will take advantage of support of the other weapons in the same way as the anti-tank defense. Thus the latter too will be from the outset be under the mental and actual influences of combat, which will have a considerable air effect on its defensive capability. It will therefore not merely see blind, deep and almost defenseless targets in the approaching combat vehicle as laymen hope. It must also be realized that firing defensive weapons, so those abandoning camouflage, will be a conspicuous target to surveilling artillery and heavy infantry weapons. Maybe it is just me, but at times this video feels like beating a dead horse that was buried decades ago. Yet we are not finished yet. We need to talk about something else. Money. 
Big thank you here to my Patreon and subscribers and supporters, by the way, for allowing me to take the time to make videos such as this possible. So far, it took 27 hours. Quite many people bring forward the cost factor. A modern battle tank is just too expensive. While this is an interesting argument, I think it has many flaws. I will just address a few that come to mind. First, it is overly reductionistic. Yes, a modern tank is quite expensive. But here's the question with what will you replace it? Because if you get rid of your tank or tanks, you need something else on the battlefield that fulfills that role. Let's just take one component. Tanks generally have large caliber direct fire weapons and machine guns. The machine guns are not a problem. One might argue artillery, but that is generally indirect fire, so I don't consider that really an option. Since artillery also lacks the protection among other things. So you will bring your infantry with towed anti-tank guns and infantry support guns? Those are very heavy and generally not in service anymore, but for the sake of arguments, let's assume this. So how do you transport them with trucks? Well, those are very susceptible to any damage from even a machine gun. And a machine gun compared to an end law is extremely cheap. But even if we let that slide, how many men do you need to replace, let's say, four tanks in terms of capabilities? 10? 50? 100? Or even more men? I don't know, but here it gets complicated, because how much does the training equipment and everything else for these guys cost? It is still probably cheaper than a tank, particularly if you look at the fool and anything. But then again, you need vehicles for these guys. If you go with regular infantry fighting vehicles like the Bradley, BMP2, Mada or even the Puma, it gets expensive again. And these infantry fighting vehicles, if they run into a bunch of tanks, even older ones, they can actually decimate your infantry fighting vehicles as well with their main guns. As you can see, the simple approach of comparing cost is flawed since we are talking about dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of factors. We are not talking about removing a single item from your monthly cost, like a newspaper subscription, a Steam game, or 10 cups of coffee. We are talking about removing an important component out of a complex system that needs to be replaced in one way or another. Second, a tank is actually very cheap if you compare it to a modern fighter jet, or let alone a warship. Simply put, a fighter jet costs usually about 10 times as much as a modern tank, at least for the United States. But particularly jet fighters have the problem that any major complication can lead to them dropping out of the sky. For instance, recently the US had to drive down to get the F-35 out of the sea, and that was not even a war situation. Now some people note the price of anti-tank weapons and the price of a tank. Well, how about we compare the price of a surface-to-air missile versus a jet fighter or a bomber for that matter? Or how about the price of a few torpedoes or anti chip missiles compared to an aircraft carrier? The price differences are also staggering and were in the past as well, but did modern jet fighter and bombers disappear? Nope, so far they didn't. Finally, cheap and expensive are very relative terms. In German documents from the military archives, I stumbled across a statement from the Second World War. Sadly, I can't find it anymore. From what I remember, an infantry officer told a tank officer that he does not care if a tank gets lost. Since it takes a few months or years to produce a tank, whereas it takes Germany about 19 years to produce an infantryman. Keep in mind that the Germans were not particularly loss aversive in the Second World War. Considering the major loss aversion nowadays, particularly in Western democracies, the question should be really if a tank can be too expensive at all. Because contrary to some statements, tanks are neither rolling coffins nor death traps. This brings us to the next and final point that was already hinted before. Now I must credit Justin Pike here since he pointed me to the following question, although on a completely different topic. Namely, what is the alternative? So what is the alternative for the tank on the battlefield? And to make us clear again what the defining characteristics of a tank are, we will quote Nehring's article from 1936 again. In summary, the characteristics for armored weapons are the combined strong offensive power under armor protection with speed and cost granting mobility. Like air forces, they fight on the move. They give the possibility to carry out operations of armies surprisingly, quickly and abruptly. Modern technology to a certain degree made that statement even more correct since during the Second World War, firing during driving was generally not particularly effective. Nowadays it is. So what is the alternative that brings firepower, protection and mobility to the battlefield in a single package? An infantry company? 
Unlikely, particularly if it's just on foot or only motorized. If it's mechanized with infantry fighting vehicles, well, those are highly susceptible to all anti-tank weapons that kill tanks and even those that are not a threat to tanks. Additionally, they will also be threatened by smaller guns and particularly auto cannons as well. At the same time, it will lack the firepower. An artillery battery, well, brings a lot of firepower, but in terms of protection, well, not so much. Self-propelled artillery vehicles are protected like infantry fighting vehicles or even less since they are usually used behind the front lines. This is also related to the direct fire capability. It can be done, but they are not designed for that. They can do it, but the reaction time and effectiveness are limited. Maybe there's an alternative, which I haven't considered, but I think there is simply none yet. Here's the point. The n law Javelin and all the other anti-tank weapons are not an alternative to the tank. They can quite easily dispatch most or even all modern tanks, particularly in an ambush, but here's the thing, the infantryman with the anti-tank weapon can also be dispatched by a regular machine gun, but that doesn't make the infantryman obsolete neither. And going back to the price argument, a bullet or even 1000 bullets are way cheaper than training and equipping a single infantryman, let alone equipping him with an N-Law, tow or a javelin. So the question is, what can move with 60 km per hour and fire 105mm shell accurately at targets at 1 or more kilometers away? while at the same time shrugging off machine and auto cannon rounds. Who or what can do this? From what I know, there are only two things that can do this. Modern main battle tanks and the Doomslayer. And the latter one is fiction, although better written fiction than most non-fiction end of tank arguments. Then again, that is not particularly hard to do. Don't get me wrong, at one point the time might come when we see the end of the tank, but I doubt it is now. Anti-tank guided missiles with heat warheads are not particularly new. The countermeasures for these weapons are composite armor and or explosive reactive armor. The latter was then countered with tandem warheads, so a warhead that sets off the reactive armor. But this is nothing new and measure and countermeasure is an old game. I mean, this was literally stated already in 1938. Both arms are mutually evolving and must constantly keep pace with each other. Nowadays, modern vehicles are equipped with active protection systems and these go back several decades as well. There are technologies that benefit tanks, and then there are ones that help defeating tanks. Probably the most interesting supposed tank killer technologies are drones, because these drones might actually favor the tank far more in the future, since one major weakness of tanks was always limited visibility. Yet a proper set of drones integrated with tanks could change that. Tanks also have space and carrying capacity for communications, processing and sensor technology as well. To conclude, as long as there is a need for mobility, firepower and protection in one package that can't be provided by anything else than a tank, the tank will very likely continue to be a viable weapon system for most armed forces. Oh, and before someone times, but the Marine Corps got rid of its tanks. The Marine Corps is part of the armed forces of the United States of America. The US Army has plenty of tanks left. The Marine Corps is a specialized branch and historically it had also neglected its tank arm as well. I would also add that I think that nearly all other weapon systems and major troop categories in a combined arms formation will remain viable as well, so infantry, mortars, artillery, recon, etc. They all fulfill specific roles that generally can't be replaced by something else, at least for now. As Scharnhorst noted, one must not consider the individual objects without the whole. Or as the English proverb goes, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. In short, combined arms warfare is very important and it is also very hard to do. But failing at combined arms does not mean that one of its arms is necessarily obsolete. Meanwhile, making unqualified statements about stuff someone knows nothing about will always be easy. I hope you learned something new. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. Special thanks to all my supporters for making trips to museums and military archives possible. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.